video 76 of the master course quantum chemistry of molecular electromagnetic properties. The topic of this lecture is coupled cluster linear response functions. When developing response function methods, one normally starts off from a time dependent expectation value of the property of interest. In chapter 97, we learned that for coupled cluster theory, such an expectation value, which is in agreement with the Hahnemann Feynman theorem, is a transition expectation value, meaning we have a different function in the bra than in the cat. In the cat, we have the normal coupled cluster state, of course now time dependent, whereas in the bra, we have the so called dual or lambda state. The definition of the time dependent wave functions are written here, so we have uh, the cover cluster wave function, again, as uh, the exponential operator with the cluster operator acting on the hard to fog wave function, but now the cluster operator is time dependent, and in addition, we also have a time dependent phase factor. And correspondingly, the dual or bra state looks like we actually had it already in uh, chapter 9-7, with the only difference that now the uh, cluster operator T is time dependent, that the uh, lambda operator or the excitation operator lambda is also time dependent and we have this time dependent phase factor. Similar or equivalent to what we have in time independent couple cluster theory, the time dependent cluster operator as well as the time dependent lambda operator consists of single excitations, double excitation, triple excitation, up to n tuple excitations operators and corresponding the lambda operator of single, double, triple and n tuple d excitation operators, where the individual t operators are defined in the usual way as a sum over all here the T1 operator is the sum over all single excitations, where we have here a single excitation operator and then multiplied with an amplitude. The difference to the time independent cases then that uh, the T amplitudes here are now time dependent. Correspondingly for the T2, the double excitation operator, and equivalently also for the D excitation or lambda operators, here the single D excitation operator, where we have then time dependent single d excitation lambda operators and for the double d excitation operator time dependent lambda operators. And we can also here use the same short term notation which we had in chapter 9 using these um, h operators. Here the excitation version of the h operator where the i indicates what the excitation level is. So for single excitation i would be 1 and here corresponding for the d excitation and u that just indicates uh, a particular excitation. So for single excitation, that would be then ai and for double excitation, it would be something like aibj. So in general, we can write then the uh, cluster operator as a sum over all these um, excitation operators here multiplied with uh, the amplitudes where uh, this combined index here is both the sum over the excitation level i and then over all the individual elements at this excitation level, which is indicated by the mu, and correspondingly the same for the d excitation operators. Now, the big question is how to determine the uh, time dependence now and how to determine these time dependent amplitudes and lambda amplitudes. And uh, in couple cluster theory, one does that just from the Schrodinger equation. So we can insert now our uh, couple cluster state and the dual state in the time dependent Schrodinger equation, which I have done here, where for the um, uh, couple cluster uh, wave function, we just insert it in the uh, normal version of the Schrodinger equation. And for the dual state, we have to insert it in uh, sort of the complex conjugate of the uh, Schrodinger equation. In both of the equations, I have also pre-multiplied with e to the minus t on both sides for the normal Schrodinger equation and e to the t on both sides from the right then uh, on the uh, complex conjugate version of the Schrodinger equation. In order to get now equations for the amplitudes, for the time-dependent t amplitudes and the time-dependent lambda amplitudes, 
we do the same trick as we do in normal couple clusters here. We project the equations against one of the excited determinants. And in particular, the excited determinant, which expansion coefficient, the amplitude we are trying to uh, determine. So we're going to uh, project uh, the normal Schrodinger equation against this uh, excited determinant, here written as the STF, uh, on which from the right I will act with the de-excitation operator. And for the equations for the complex conjugate version, I will project against right against this excited determinant. Now doing that, um, then eventually I can let take the derivatives of here the lambda state and the derivative of the time dependent couple cluster state. And after some derivations, we will end up with these two equations, where you can see that the first equation, which comes from here, is then an equation for the time derivative of a particular t amplitude, the t amplitude corresponding to the excited determinant which, against which I had projected with respect to the time. Um, and corresponding from this equation, I get an equation for the uh, time derivative of a lambda amplitude. Again, the lambda amplitude which belongs to this uh, uh, excited determinant. So now we have two differential equations which uh, determine the time dependence of these two uh, amplitudes. Now we'll use perturbation theory, like we have done it already several times, which means now we will expand our time dependent t amplitudes and the time dependent lambda amplitudes here in a perturbation series, where the first term, the zeroth order term, are the time independent uh, t amplitudes. And then we get a first order correction, which is time dependent, and so forth, second order correction, and correspondingly for the lambda amplitudes. Now inserting these expansions on both sides of uh, these two equations, we can then, like always in perturbation theory, collect uh, all the terms of a given order in the corresponding sort of equation of this order. So, and we are interested in linear response theory here, so we will collect all the terms in first order together in, in a first equation. And here is the, the first order equation for the T amplitudes, and here the first order equation for the lambda amplitudes. That means here we have the time derivative of the first order correction to the T amplitudes, and we get uh, two terms. We get First, a term which involves our time independent first order Hamiltonian. That means that's the operator which represents the interaction of our molecular system with the perturbation. And then we get uh, a second term, which is the sum over all the first order correction to the lambda amplitudes times uh, this matrix A here, which I have written up uh, down here, the definition of an element of this matrix A which is called the Kappa cluster Jacobian matrix. Correspondingly, in the equation for the time derivative of the first order lambda equations, we have also one term which uh, involves our first order perturbation operator. And then we get one term, which includes again a sum over all first order correction to the T amplitudes multiplied with uh, a matrix which is called F, and the definition of this I have given down here. And in addition to that, we get also the sum over all the first order correction to the lambda equations multiplied again with the same uh, couple cluster Jacobian A matrix. In both of these equations here, the only time dependent terms are now our first order uh, Hamiltonian here and here, that's time dependent, and the amplitudes are time dependent. But the wave functions here, the SCF and the couple cluster wave function, are now the time independent, time independent wave function, and also the T operator here is the time independent version of the couple cluster operator. Now let's look at this A and F matrices. You can see the A matrix is. Um, here we have a commutator of the unperturbed Hamiltonian with a single excitation operator, but it's only a single commutator. Uh, and then 
uh, this is sandwiched between the couple cluster wave function and this uh, excited determinant, which is first multiplied by e to the minus t. Um, and the F matrix now, the F matrix contains a double commutator of the Hamiltonian with two excitation operators and then evaluated over uh, uh, the couple cluster wave function and the dual state uh, wave function. So in a way, the, the F is more equivalent to what we had in um, second-order polarization propagator response function method or uh, MCSF response function method corresponding to the Hessian, whereas the A is actually more corresponding to um, a kind of a gradient operator, gradient term, because we have a single commutator of the Hamiltonian with an excitation operator. The A, the cover cluster Jacobi matrix, actually can be derived as the derivative of the cover cluster vector function. Remember, the cover cluster vector function is um, actually the term or the equation from which one determines the uh, time independent cover cluster amplitudes, because the equation is that the cover cluster uh, vector function has, been, has to be equal to zero. Now, the this Jacobi matrix is actually the derivative of this couple cluster vector function with respect to another T amplitude. Now, the two equations which we had derived now for the uh, time development of the first order correction to the T amplitudes and the first order correction to the lambda amplitudes are differential equations because they involve a uh, time derivative. A way to solve these equations is actually to make a Fourier transformation and transform from the time domain to the frequency domain because in the frequency domain um, the time derivative actually disappears and it actually essentially leads to multiplying with the frequency so in the fre frequency domain we instead of having a differential equation with the time derivative we will ha just have a set of linear equations in order to do that, we need now to look at the Fourier components or the Fourier transformation of our T amplitudes. So we, uh, the Fourier transformation of the time dependent T amplitudes to, to frequency dependent T amplitudes or the first order correction to the T amplitudes. And these are then typically written not as the first order T amplitudes, but they're written as a product of um, some Fourier comp components x for the t amplitudes and y for the lambda amplitudes multiplied with the um, component of the uh, field. And uh, this is just the exponential from the Fourier transformation here. Inserting these two expressions for the um, time dependent first order correction to the t and to lambda amplitude as this uh, Fourier transformation gives us uh, these two equations where we already have taken the uh, derivative then um, and as a consequence of taking the derivative they both include on the left hand side now an extra factor h bar times omega which is here and which is there so this is what came out of the equation for the first order correction to the T amplitude and this for the first order correction of the lambda amplitudes. Both uh, uh, equations now have uh, in all terms an integral over the frequencies uh, coming from the Fourier transformation, but uh, um, the relation have to hold for every value of the frequency and for any field strength, which means that actually the kernels of the integrals have to be equal. So I can get two equations where I just set the, the kernels of the, uh, of the integrals equal on uh, both sides. And that gives us these two equations here. Here are the equation for the Fourier components of the first order correction to the T amplitudes. And here an equation for the Fourier components of the first order correction to the lambda amplitudes now. And again, we can see that the equation for one particular Fourier component of a T amplitude here, x i mu, depends on all other Fourier components for the T amplitudes because here I have a sum over all these axes. And similar for the lambda amplitudes, uh, the equation for the uh, 
why I'm you depends on all the other y's and in addition on all the x's, which of course means that one first has to solve the equation for the uh, Fourier components of the t amplitudes and then afterwards can solve the equations for the um, Fourier components of the lambda amplitudes. In order to solve these equations so that one has not in a way does an iterative solution to it, we combine now the, ter the two terms which depend on the uh, x uh, amplitudes here and then move them uh, to the left hand side and similar here with the y amplitudes and that gives us now these two equations where I have written them now as a, a matrix equation. So x is a, is a vector containing all the x amplitudes and y is a vector containing all the uh, y amplitudes. And we can see that we can then obtain x as solution to this equation where we have to calculate here the inverse of our Jacobian, uh, uh, cluster Jacobian A matrix minus or subtracted from uh, a unit matrix which has on the diagonal standing uh, the frequency. And then acting this uh, on this term here, which is the integral coming from from the integral over our first order perturbation Hamiltonian. Um, since we have removed the, the field strength, we just have here our perturbation operator. And corresponding in the lambda equations here, we have uh, the integral or the term with our perturbation operator. And then we also get the term uh, with the F matrix and all the X amplitudes. And these are uh, basically uh, our final equation. These are the response equations for uh, the T amplitudes here in the uh, frequency domain and for the lambda amplitudes in the frequency domain. And as I said already before, uh, one first has to solve the equation for the X uh, amplitudes here before we can go on to solve for the Y because we need the solution for the x amplitudes here in order to solve for the y amplitudes. Now we can compare these response equations to the ones which we had for uh, Merleau-Plessy perturbation theory polarization propagators like the second order polarization propagator or for the MCSF linear response case. And there are a few uh, important differences here. In the case of the SOPRA and MCSF response equation there's one set of response equations. Whereas here in the case of the Kappa cluster response, there are two set of response equations one has to solve, one for the T amplitudes and one for the lambda amplitudes. On the other hand, the Kappa cluster Jacobian matrix is only half of the size of the corresponding Hessian matrices in the Merleau Blessed perturbation here polarization propagator methods, because there we have excitation and de excitation operators, whereas here in the couple cluster uh, response equation, we only have one set of operators, the excitation operators. The final difference is that the couple cluster Jacobian matrix is inherently asymmetric, which implies when one wants to diagonalize this in order to get excitation energies and uh, transition moments from the eigenvectors one will have to solve for the left and the right eigenvectors because they will not be the same. So having solved these two sets of response equations, we uh, have now obtained the Fourier components X and Y of the first order time dependent amplitudes, both the T amplitudes and the lambda amplitudes, which means now we can insert those in the expression for the first order correction to the expectation value. So here's our expansion of the uh, couple cluster expectation value, or time dependent couple cluster expectation value and the first term of course is the time independent uh, expectation value and then the first order correction to that. We have now two terms, one where we have uh, the first order T amplitudes and one where we have the first order lambda amplitudes. And if we now insert the uh, Fourier uh, transformation for those, we get the corresponding expression where we have now here our X uh, Fourier components and our Y Fourier components. And both these contributions, this one and that one together, are the 
contributions to the uh, time dependent expectation value, which are linear in the field. We can now compare this expression here with the corresponding expressions for the expansion of a time dependent expectation value for exact states in chapter three. And doing that, we can then identify our couple cluster approximation to the exact linear response function. And this is this one here. And we get uh, two contributions because we also had two response equations. Well, here we had the response of the t-amplitudes, and here we have the response of the lambda-amplitudes. The uh, t-vectors here are now, uh, again, property gradient vectors, and we have also two, two different ones. We have one here with uh, for the bra state, the lambda state, as you can see here, and we have here one for the normal cover cluster state, which is this one. Now, if we insert now the expression for our, I mean, the response equation for the x and the y, uh, which I have done here, then we get this as the final expression for the cover cluster uh, linear response function. We're writing it all out. We actually get uh, three contributions here. In the first two, we have one property created with the couple cluster state and one property created with the um, lambda state, whereas in the last contribution, we have twice uh, the property created with the couple cluster state, and we have also this F matrix here, and we actually have twice the uh, couple cluster uh, Jacobian. Now, if you look at that, we can see that all three contributions have a term have the inverse of here a unit matrix times the frequency minus the uh, couple cluster Jacobian matrix. This is important when we're interested in finding the poles of our response function, meaning uh, trying to find the excitation energies. So we have to look at these uh, terms here, these inverse matrices. So in order to calculate uh, the poles of the couple cluster linear response function, and therefore the uh, vertical excitation energies, we have to find the eigenvalues of the couple cluster Jacobian. So we have to solve an eigenvalue equation like this, where here I've written up the right eigenvector. I might as well have written it up also with the left eigenvector. That's the same. So excitation energies we get, again get from uh, solving an eigenvalue problem for uh, what in the case of MCSF and SOPA was the molecular Hessian, and here in couple cluster theory, it's this um, couple cluster Jacobian, which, as I mentioned before, is inherently a non symmetric matrix, which has some consequences for the calculation of the eigenvalues. Now, I mentioned before that the couple cluster Jacobian. Uh, can be derived as the derivative of the couple cluster vector function with respect to um, T amplitude. And let's see how that looks like then for CCSD and CC2. So here's the couple cluster Jacobian written up for CCSD. Where we have in the upper left corner, we have a part with two single excitation operators in the rower. Right corner, we have a part with two double excitation or de excitation operators, and in the off diagonal blocks, we have sort of one single excitation and one double excitation operator. Now, we should remember that the difference between CCSD and CC2 is that in the couple cluster vector function, one approximated the part of it, I mean, approximated the equation for the uh, doubles amplitudes. And that must also mean that we will see here now uh, a difference in the part which includes um, involves double excitation operators, which means this pure uh, single excitation, single excitation part, that's exactly the same in both methods. And it turns out to be also the part here which has um, a double excitation operator here and a single de excitation operator here is the same. But the difference are in the lower part here. Here we have uh, 
double D excitation operator and a single excitation operator. And in um, the CCSD method, we have both the T1 transformed unperturbed Hamiltonian uh, here and a commutator of this T1 transformed Hamiltonian with a T2 operator. But that's precisely the kind of term which is um, neglected in the CC2 model. So we don't have that here. And similar over uh, in this pure double double excitation term, we have again a T1 uh, transformed unperturbed Hamiltonian, which now in the CC2 model just becomes the Fock operator um, here. In addition to comparing CC2 to CCSD, I also want to compare CC2 to uh, the Sopper method. Both are, in principle, uh, second order methods, but there are significant differences. The first difference is that the dimension of the CC2 Jacobian is smaller than the dimension of the Sopper Hessian, because, as I said before, in Kappa cluster we only have. Um, excitation operators, whereas in the uh, SOPA method we have excitation and de-excitation methods. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, pure double excitation block in CC2 uh, and the de-zero matrix in SOPA, uh, they have essentially the same elements. So that's the same, the treatment of the double excitation is uh, at the same level in both methods, the pure double excitations. Um, what corresponds to the C matrix, C1 matrices, these are the single excitation, double excitation uh, coupling blocks in CC2. Um, and the elements are, are similar. However, uh, there are differences there because in uh, CC2 we have always a T1 transformed Hamiltonian there, which we don't have in the, uh, in the super method. And the same also holds uh, for the single excitation part, which uh, the single excitation part of CC2 would correspond to the A matrix in SOPA, but again, in CC2, uh, we have this T1 transformed Hamiltonian. Now, CC2 and CCSD both have single and double excitation. So what about couple cluster methods for response functions, which include triple excitations? Well, uh, there also have been derived uh, and implemented response function for the CC3 model. Remember, CC3 model is an approximation to the full CCSDT model in the same way as CC2 as to CCSD, which means in CC3, one has the same uh, part of the couple cluster Jacobi matrix for the single and double excitation operators, but the triple excitation operators, this part, again, are approximated. Nevertheless, the uh, number of triple excitations is so large that uh, for practical applications, uh, it is necessary to write the CC3 Jacobian in the partition form introduced in uh, chapter 10. Um, that has the consequent that uh, then the, in the partition form, the CC3 Jacobian depends on its own eigenvalues, which means one has to iterate for each eigenvalue separately. In order to avoid that, one can use the uh, pseudo perturbation theory, which was introduced in chapter 312, also here for uh, the couple cluster problem, where one would treat in the pseudo perturbation theory, one would treat the triple excitations as the perturbation, which means one has to solve the full CCSD problem, and then one can add to it in a non iterative way a correction coming from the triple excitations. And uh, this method is called CCSD, CCSD parenthesis 3 and um, is used uh, quite successfully for the calculation of vertical excitation energies. A final method which I want to mention here in the chapter about couple cluster response function is the so-called equation of motion couple cluster approach UM CCSD, which is related to the CCSD linear response function approach, but is derived differently. Now the excitation energy, the vertical excitation energy are actually exactly the same in EOM CCSD and the ones which one obtains from the CCSD linear response function. Uh, 
but the transition moments are different and second order properties which one also can calculate from that eom ccsd approach differ also somewhat from the ones which one obtains from ccsd linear response function because there are certain terms neglected in the EOM, EOM CCSD approach, which are included in the CCSD linear response approach. 